know the second invite. Set up, follow the instructions, set up your accounts, set up the tickers, be ready. Uh, maybe you, uh, you can set up all the tickers just just to be on the safe side then you can straight away trade and the moment you want to trade on options you just right click on it and uh, just straight away because I've been using the option trader so it's already got that as one of the options one of the options otherwise you just go to trading tools and click on option trader and then you'll get to the uh, option trader interface which I have here I still have the crude oil options because in our time when we are having our classes uh, the US equity options will not be they won't be live prices for those options because the underlying and the options market and the underlying market are closed okay so uh, that's why I have kept okay so let's start the uh, our okay so our next question is the next point we wanted to study about options as we uh, cover uh, we traverse our introductory uh, coverage of options so we want to talk about aspects of an option contract does anybody know what I mean by aspects of an option contract so aspects of an option contract essentially is just any uh, we try to uh, Just open this. So any the point of I mean what I mean by aspects of an option contract is that if you say if you walk into a consumer electronics store and you tell the uh, salesman I want to buy a TV, is that enough information for him? He needs more information. What screen size? LED, LCD. Whether you have a brand preference. How many RG? Whether you need a RGB port. How many USB ports? Whether it's a smart TV. All kinds of stuff. You need to clarify a lot of other stuff before he can actually take you to the right TV. Eventually, you come to a brand and model combination, which has all the specifications. Right? This is clear. So it's the same thing. That if you just go and tell a market maker that I want to buy an option. That's not enough information for him, right? So what information do you want to give him? We want to be clear about that. So if you're going to a market maker and asking for an option price, what information do you have to give him? Anybody wants to volunteer? Maturity. Maturity. Okay, so we call that the expiration date. Okay. Expiration date. I'm just going to write short form here. Okay, expiration date is one. Uh, we can write this okay we can just write this as yeah next thing you said is strike price, strike price. okay this is the point that Kanika raised yesterday strike price so I'm just going to use shorthand you don't need to remember all this stuff I mean basically you should be able to work it out every time and then even eventually it will just become uh, embedded in your memory so one is obviously expiration date you need to mention then you need to mention strike price and what is the quantity, term? quantity. Quantity, yeah, okay, fine. We can write quantity also. Quantity, number of uh, number of contracts. This quantity will be number of contracts. Number of option contracts. Yes. What do you mean? Can you use better language for that? Asset market, underlying market. Okay. So underlying market, and usually, and and if you if you go back to what we learned here yesterday. That we learned some new things yesterday which you may not normally find in most textbooks that we learned that all kinds of instruments can be underlying for options including options okay so this part is normally not mentioned in most of the textbooks so if we look back if, if we go and uh, just uh, open that thing once again so So therefore, when you're talking about underlying market in the context of options and in the context of this question about what are the aspects of an option contract that you have to specify in order for the market maker to understand exactly what you're looking for, right? So therefore, when you're talking about markets, you have to, maybe we need to make it a little smaller. Okay, we can see pretty much everything we need. Okay, options a little bit. So. When you're talking about underlying markets, uh, in the case of the option, you have to really talk in terms of a, it's not sufficient to talk about underlying as base, let's say dollar yen, 
No, if if you say dollar yen, underline, that's not good enough because you further have to specify the instrument. Okay, because you could have you could be talking about dollar yen spot or dollar yen forward or dollar yen futures. Okay, or dollar yen options. Maybe you're looking for a compound option on dollar yen. So therefore, you have to when you talk about the underlying in the context of aspects of an option contract, you need to talk about the underlying as a market instrument combination. Okay, so we write that here as so underlying market. Okay, really is uh, has to be in the and write equal to here as market into instrument combo so it is not sufficient to say i want an option on dollar yen you have to say i want an option on uh, this part is in your notes okay this is in your note the note the file in which this so these things you don't have to but i will try to write less today because i noticed that there are no views for the video yesterday so people are again falling back on notes and not watching because there's some stuff which is in the videos like credit derivatives the discussion on credit derivatives which is not in the notes so it's actually what is required so i'll write less and less uh, but some of this stuff because when i'm asking you guys i need to note down what she's saying what she's saying uh, you know add up the points so the point to understand underlying market is not sufficient to say dollar yen you have to say dollar yen futures spot dollar yen dollar yen options all this stuff okay so it has to be mentioned as a market instrument combination and in the in the context of this particular project that you're doing what is your underlying going to be this us equity option trading project that you're going to be doing what is your underlying uh, underlying going to be like one of the markets is microsoft microsoft common stock but it's what is the instrument spot instrument is spot okay so it's basically spot market for microsoft common stock amazon ford etc etc okay so therefore the market instrument combination concept has to be there okay so when you're talking about the underlying market because you can have options on all kinds of instruments okay <laughs> all right anything else expiration date we've got we've got strike price quantity i didn't have as a point actually but uh, we can have that as well uh, it would be initially I, I i assumed it was just for one contract but that's okay that's a valid point you can have quantity strike price expiration date market into its market underlying market what else anything else yes spot price that you have already uh, not don't say spot price because then you're fixating on one type of instrument you have to say underlying price okay what you mean is that what you mean uh, you should refer to it as underlying price don't say spot price okay because the underlying may be a dollar yen option a dollar yen futures contract okay so in that case the spot price is not correct okay so you have to really say underlying price but the underlying price is not you have already specified the underlying the underlying price the market maker will figure out on his own okay anything else that we can see what have you told him led or lcd what are the basic i only said i only said to the market maker i want to buy an option so what is the basic thing call or put you have to specify call or put okay that you have to specify so you have specified call or put you have specified the ex uh, exercise price i also don't have it memorized so we have to just see if everything is okay call or put you have to specify the expiration uh, the exercise price expiration date underlying market okay so we have 1 2 3 4 there's one more element which you have to which you may not be familiar when you studied options in fm1 fm2 did you study about exercise style yes or no okay fine so there's one more element which is called exercise style okay why do you think if you see when i went to the last why when we were defining options earlier why did we use why did i add this kind of a convoluted phrase because the person who was i think tarun or somebody who was mentioning time uh, only mentioned a particular time but i added this at or up to 
a specified time and I think somebody mentioned as well that there should be up to it could be up to a point of time or at a point of time okay and then I added not just time but I added time okay so you have basically you have three types of exercise okay and this part I will uh, so clearly the internet connection is erratic because this software is losing its connectivity many times okay so we have specified call or put okay underlying asset we have specified as a market instrument combination expert expiration date strike price this is the part that we have not specified okay so you have three types of exercise okay American European and Bermudan you can read this okay so I'm You've heard about, so you've been taught about American and European style exercise, but you've forgotten. Sorry? Yeah. Don't say expiration, say expiration. Yeah. No, no, you're actually saying it the other way around. So what she's saying is she has mixed up the, the definitions of American and European. American is at any point of time. So these particular, these particular things that you're doing, if this is just a matter of convention okay so like foreign exchange options uh, spot options or uh, foreign exchange are actually uh, european style on spot okay so uh, this uh, in this case by convention the us equity options are american style okay so american style means essentially even if you buy a nine month option you don't have to wait till the end of nine months to exercise the option if you want to exercise the option you can do it anytime that's because these are American style options by convention. Okay, this is just a matter of convention as to what um, you know, what, what the market decides, uh, you know, how what kind of option it wants to trade. So the point is that there is a fifth element which you have to specify, which is well actually a sixth element because Tanya added the matter of quantity, uh, number of units you want to buy, which is correct actually. So we should add that here. Um, we'll add it as a zero. That will be better. So I don't have to disturb the numbering style. which is number of contracts, which is already there in that other note, so I'll add it here. You can write, sorry? Yeah, you can write quantity. I'm just writing quantity as number of contracts because an option you'll be leading at, you can write position size or you can write amount, same thing, comes to the same thing. Because in, in this exchange, number of contracts arises when you're doing exchange traded options. But when you're doing OTC options, you will be talking about an amount, okay? So you can write this as both, basically. You can write it as amount, okay? And you can write it as number of contracts. Quantity is already written as quantity. Amount or number of contracts, okay? Okay, so we have uh, this thing to understand. There's another element to understand that the because an option is a contract, it confers certain rights. And so those rights are one of those rights is basically talks about when you can exercise. So if it is American style, you can exercise at any point of time from the time you buy the option to the expiration date. If it is European, it is uh, at any point, it is only at the end of the period. And if it is uh, Bermudan, then it is at specified points of time. So you might have a Bermudan option for one year where you can exercise at the end of every month, but not within the month. So every last day of the month. So you could have a, you could have like, if it's a one year option, you could have a situation, a Bermudan option where you can exercise on the last day of every month, but not anywhere in between. Okay. So that becomes a Bermudan, which is like a cross between the, uh, between uh, American and European. Okay. So you need to put in all this stuff. Obviously this, uh, the other elements, which uh, you can see from this itself, which is, uh, so these are the elements that you have to specify. Okay. When you have exercise style, you have American style, European style, Bermudan. And then uh, the market maker will put in the other stuff. Okay. Like you were talking about the price of the underlying that, that the market maker will figure out for himself. 
okay he will figure it out he'll look at the market price so some of the other inputs that go into it which you can easily see when you I've already given you the link for this and I think I have pasted some other links uh, not yet okay I'll just paste them today um, so a whole bunch of other links that you have I'm just gonna paste them here You guys have the 10th edition of the book or the 9th edition? You have the 9th edition, bro. So one of the things you can do is uh, you can read this on the global financial crisis. If you want to get a little bit more of a uh, slightly more technical reading on the global financial, well, I will not have time to cover this. Okay. So you can read this for yourself. It's optional reading. I'm not putting it as part of the syllabus. Uh, you, it's optional reading uh, and you can read this uh, on, on uh, chap in chapter 8 of uh, the Halbasu. Okay. Uh, let me go uh, sorry not here we are not trying to go here we are trying to go okay. so these are actually so there's a whole bunch of links which you can use okay all kind of stuff all this option price.com which i'm using okay so here you can see that there's some other inputs which the uh, trader the market maker himself will find out from the market and enter okay one of these is the ball okay this is referred to volatility in the future we are not going to use this big word anymore we are just going to call it ball okay so this thing he will have to find out an input okay and uh, he will determine it himself so the other is dividend deal which i have described as which i have described here as the three other things that he has to uh, clarify okay so one is the vol you can see that he's got taken the vol you can look at this formula and this you have the link to the software you can look at it one is the vol okay no this rounding is not really this is for the software rounding if you don't count this as a factor in the option pricing this is just the particular way of uh, the software is uh, wants you to know like it wants to tell you uh, basically it, the software is asking you to tell it uh, up to how many decimal places do you want this okay so this is not a factor which we consider when we are learning the theory what we really want to know is what is the interest rate and what is the not we don't want to just talk about dividend yield because dividend is only paid by stocks that's why I have talking talked about the expected yield on the underlying asset okay so these two are actually quite similar if you see interest rate interest rate is if you buy the asset if you borrow money and buy the asset remember we already mentioned that in finance we want to talk about everything whenever we discuss in finance uh, whenever we are buying something we are buying it and putting it on uh, deposit okay and earning a return on it or if we are selling it we are borrowing it and selling it okay so this this idea needs to be there so interest rate and expected yield on the asset essentially are uh, you can think of the interest rate as also involved in when you are when you are uh, using borrowing to finance the purchase of an asset you have to pay interest on it so the interest rate and the yield on the asset are kind of two sides like you take a housing loan and you finance the let's say you buy take a hundred percent for the sake of argument we assume you take a hundred percent housing loan on a house okay no bank will give it to you but um, in the in the global financial crisis run in the run-up to the crisis some of the banks were doing that zero money down so you would get the hundred percent of the value of the house would be loaned to you okay so uh, but in normal times it doesn't happen okay but let's just assume for the sake of argument so you buy 100 percent take 100 percent loan buy a house and then you put that house on uh, rent so the rent is the return on the asset and the interest you're paying on your housing loan is the cost of the asset right so you can see both sides so that's why you can see clearly basically we have two other elements which we have to put in which you can just look at the formula so the interest rate on uh, which basically deals with the financing cost of buying the asset and the expected yield so i've written this in a it should be thought of in a more general way expected yield on the underlying asset because this is actually a this is for pricing stock options okay that's why it talks about dividend yield Okay. so that's why so because we don't want to use a word like dividend deal because dividend is a very particular word it applies only to stocks okay so in the case of bonds it will not apply so that's why I've used a more we should think of this as a more general term which is the expected yield on the underlying asset dividend is an expected yield on the equity holding are you following that 
you agree that dividend is an expected yield so if I use a general expression like expected yield on the underlying asset when you are talking about stocks that becomes a dividend right so these are the three other elements that the market maker has to enter and then obviously as you were saying underlying price he needs to know what the underlying price is okay suppose he finds he will look at the market these are talking about spot equities okay so uh, exercise price you have mentioned to him days until expiration etc okay interest rate and all he has figured out and he puts in all these numbers maybe he puts in something else for volatility he can put in maybe 45 okay so we'll come to this determination of what this ball is okay <coughs> and how this number is derived so at the moment in our superficial assessment of uh, superficial coverage of options at this point of time we just know that there is also a ball input that needs to go into this option pricing model okay so this is actually what we will discuss later on the difference between price and valuation this normally in the industry this is referred to as an option pricing model okay but actually it's really an option valuation model all right so it's actually an option valuation model but this unfortunately the the word is stuck so if you go and start talking you can always explain it to them why you call it a valuation model or a pricing model okay but these are generally referred to as option pricing models so we may also refer to them as that but actually they are option valuation model the model as designed is a valuation model you understand the difference between value and price not very clear right okay because we want many other things what is happening is they are, you are being taught a lot of techniques and people don't have a very good sense of uh, they don't have very good context about what exactly uh, is yeah so in the case of no in theory there is a difference okay in theory there is a difference actually pricing model is not a good expression because you don't need a model to price it the market prices things based on the interaction of supply and demand okay so option pricing model which is used everywhere even in the academic finance literature that actually is wrong you don't need a model to price something you need only a valuation model because pricing is anyway done by the market and later on when you see when we get into the eyeball concept okay so everywhere ball means volatility so if we get into once we understand what eyeball wall is okay and then we'll talk about two different types of wall historical volatility which we'll call H wall and implied volatility which we'll call I wall okay so once you get into that you'll understand that actually this is really uh, it's kind of like a it is now being uh, you know used as a, co a kind of a cop out because really they can't they're taking the market price and putting it into the uh, this uh, valuation model okay so but it's important to theoretically understand what is value and price like you are doing this corporate finance modeling course which has started now for instance i saw your senior sina was your senior vibram sina so he did good work but he was not clear he came out with an analysis he did a lot of good uh, analysis on all that calculations but then he came out with a valuation of a stock actually okay which i think he came out with a price of 74 and the market price of that stock was 414 or something and in his presentation he never talked about that difference so i found out what the market price was and it was 414 and he came out with the valuation so you have to be clear what your most of these models are actually that's actually what you're doing there these are actually valuation models these are fair value models okay so you have to understand these kinds of things so many uh, the, the you need to have that context hopefully we'll have time to have that discussion okay that what is so you have to that analysis is not complete so he just did his projections he did his assumptions he did his projections he did a lot of good excel calculations okay so it, he put in some solid work it was not a uh, you know a bad job but the point is that he just came out with 74 okay my job is done but the market price is 404 you need to say something about why because the market price is more important than your assessment of 74 so the market price is 414 and you are coming out with 74 your analysis is not complete until you make some comment about the difference between the market price and your assessment this is called fair value okay so you have to understand basically that since we are having this discussion and we are talking briefly about models maybe we should understand maybe you should have this brief discussion i think because you guys are doing other stuff also so let's have this brief discussion now and note, put it down in your notes okay these are the links this is just your this is one point and we are talking about aspects of an option contract are you guys following the discussion so far yes, sir. okay and now we are talking about let's have this important very very important discussion okay 
this is basically called uh, this is the discussion on uh, value versus price okay so we are making basically did, uh, but this is a very fundamental element which you will not find in most of the books so it's important that you be given this uh, definition so let's talk about to understand this let's also go to your calc which is in your let's go to your calc file now this is already with you okay so this you have access to you don't have to worry about this now remember when we were talking about decision problems right we went through many of the decision problems we talked about uh, we said that asset class market and instrument this is a, these are decision problems but these are normally solved by the investor you can see how in this particular project once again i'm tying your hands i'm not allowing you to trade crude oil futures and stuff like that i'm allowing i'm forcing you to trade i'm boxing you into this just like in the first project in ipm i boxed you into uh, this same box i'm actually boxing you into the same box right in the first project i boxed you into this box and as a subset of this box i boxed you into the indian sub box okay now again now what i'm doing in this particular project is something different okay once again i'm tying your hands your instrument hand is also tied we said asset class market and instrument our uh, asset class market and instrument are three uh, the first three decision problems which asset class should i invest in which markets which instruments okay and so in the first project i tied your hands by putting you into this box okay spot equities and then further i tied your hands by putting you into the indian sub box okay you could not trade toyota motor stock on the osaka stock exchange you won't, you didn't have the freedom to do that in this project i am further tying your hands where am i going i am going into this intersection i am going into equities and uh, options fb options just given as an example okay and further inside this box i am tying you into the us sub box okay so you have to imagine it this way so once again uh, asset class market and instrument these decisions are normally made by the investor who is financing you they will typically put some constraints on you or sometimes the money manager might himself say i only want to trade commodity futures and this my fund is focused on commodity futures and then he'll go and target investors who might be interested in such a narrowly defined fund okay so either way it gets defined very quickly uh, um, and uh, mainly based on expertise of the investor and the liquidity considerations and things like that so that solves these three important decision problems now we went into the uh, you, we went into the other then we went into the other decision problems okay but you notice one thing we did not cover initially i just told you for buy and sell you just look at charts and form your view like i have formed a view that i have gone long swiss franc dollar swiss okay so i've gone long dollars because my view is that this uptrend from here is not yet over this is going to go up so just look at the chart and this is a legitimate approach so this is the technical analysis approach you just look at the chart think of it as a sur your surface surfing waves and just take a view on where the next wave is going okay this is a completely legitimate approach but this is the technical approach so here we were trying to solve the buy sell problem so we didn't spend that much time on buy sell i just told you that for buy sell you do it this way right for buy sell you do it this way uh we're here okay so you just look at so we looked at only the ta so here it says solved either by uh, using ta or fa or afv okay we'll come to what afv is okay but we we had a limited discussion on the buy sell decision problem we only gave you the technical way to solve it because and the reason we did that is because we didn't have time so i could give you a very simple technical approach okay which is a 100% legitimate approach but i could not give you a comprehensive discussion of buy sell because that would have taken more time okay and we needed to get you going on the project okay so now we are going to come when you come to this so so, so is this clear now what is the context okay so we did not adequately address the buy sell problem so we'll now go into that okay as a as a fundamental prelude because since you are doing this other course also you should understand um, there is your calc yeah okay so in your calc file you'll find that there is a sheet like this okay this is called dp4 paradigms why dp4 because decision problem 4 is to buy or to sell okay now here you need to have this comprehensive perspective of how i don't know if you can read at the back can you can you read you are able to read all the stuff value agnostic and all the stuff okay all right so essentially 
but still not big enough to capture everything i need to maybe make it even smaller but i'm not going to make it smaller because then i don't think you can read then okay so here you try to understand this that there are two broad ways to solve this pi cell problem okay you need to understand the theoretical framework this is total theoretical framework okay and you won't find this anywhere so you understand this because this is how it basically it is okay so there are two basic approaches to solving the buy sell decision problem everybody understands the buy sell decision problem any asset you're looking at okay uh, any uh, any uh, market instrument combination that you're looking at you have the fundamental problem should i buy this or sell it there are two basic approaches to solve this either you have a value agnostic you know what an agnostic is agnostic is basically you can think of agnostic these are not very well defined but agnostic is somebody who's not really sure who doesn't really know okay or doesn't really care okay so you can say agnostic is someone who doesn't really know whether there's a as opposed to a religious person okay who knows that there is a jesus or a allah or vishnu or whatever okay uh, he doesn't really know whether there is any god he doesn't not, not particularly bothered about this question okay so an atheist these are again not very well defined but i am defining it for the purposes of the discussion a better way to define an atheist is someone who is convinced that there is no god okay so you want to distinguish between an atheist and an agnostic an atheist is an uh, opposite of a religious person an atheist is convinced that there is no god okay and an agnostic can be defined as someone who is not really sure i mean i'm not sure if there's a god but i am also not sure that there is like this jesus christ and you know uh, muhammad and all these people so i'm not sure it's, i really don't care i'm not particularly bothered okay that's an agnostic okay so uh, what i mean by value agnostic means basically i don't care about value you will understand what value is okay so uh, what what is one is value agnostic which is purely price based this you are already familiar with for from what i told you what i have shown you here what i am doing here i look at this because of course i have a longer term perspective also my view is this overall uptrend in dollar swiss is going to resume there's actually a daily uptrend also there so that's why i've gone long because my view is this from here the long term uptrend has started again it's going up this is not complete it's going to eventually break above this go above parity this is called parity in all these exchange rates when we talk about oh is the euro going to parity you might hear such a discussion in the markets if you're listening to tv which you guys are not doing enough i think business tv you'll hear discussion like the euro going to parity is cable going to parity parity just means one so in dollar swiss is dollar i would say dollar swiss is going to go through break through parity and go higher okay that's my view so this is just basically i don't really care about value you'll see what value is later on i'm just looking at price i'm only concerned with price so at this point we make the more make the distinction with price and value okay so uh, this is so but, but broadly understand the basic difference is okay so the broad difference we are making you understand this framework that the pink part is the high level classification then under the pink part i have these further breaks you are able to follow the i'm not saying you have to understand what visually you are able to follow this right visually you are able to follow what i'm showing the boxes okay so the broad split is in the pink part one is value versus price comparison based analysis one basic approach so there are two basic approaches okay so you have i and and the other one which you are familiar with which is the ta approach technical analysis okay which we are only going to refer to as ta okay this is what it says here this is ta in case you are not able to see it so on this right hand side we have ta okay technical analysis okay i have not made i have not sort of written technical analysis but ta is technical analysis so in technical analysis i don't what you have seen already we've discussed many times i look at this chart i form a view that this thing is going up okay i don't really care about value i'm only concerned with price okay so let's understand what is the difference between price and value and this we should write down here value versus price now which is objective price is objective and value is subjective or value is subjective objective and price is subjective yeah. value is subjective yes. okay good so value is subjective very good so you know this is the first thing were you aware of this distinction before you were aware some of you are aware but not everybody you have not discussed it directly anywhere okay so it's important this is a very fundamental distinction that you should be aware of what do i mean by price is objective what is the dollar swiss price right now 
99.20. Okay, we just say 99, we don't say 0 0.99. So 99.20 is the dollar Swiss price. Whether you like it or not, this is the price. And there is no doubt about it. Somebody sitting in Tokyo can see the price. Somebody sitting in Nigeria can see the price. It's the same thing for everybody. This is the price of dollar Swiss, okay? Similarly, what was the closing price of Microsoft in, uh, in uh, New York yesterday? 136.33. There's no dispute about this. You may think it's too high, too low, doesn't matter, but this is the price. It's objective. So price is always objective. That's why I said that when the when the finance literature uses and industry people also use option pricing model. That's actually not correct because pricing, you don't need to have, uh, basically you can see here the prices of the options. If you see, this is for the, um, yeah. the uh, underlying contract here which is this can't be the uh, October 19 contract because it's going beyond the October 19 expiry so for this actually it's the next contract which is there here you'll see okay this is actually I'm not able to pull it down right now but this is actually a, this will have to be a later contract okay so this is 120 day let's look at this one let's say okay so december also this will have to be the december or january contract okay where you can see these are the uh, prices so these are the prices of options okay if you're looking at call options these are the prices these are essentially determined by demand and supply okay in the marketplace okay so now uh, therefore basically you don't need a pricing pricing model term is actually not correct okay because pricing is done in the market and pricing is objective okay price is whatever it is okay so um, okay so that so price is objective now what is value now if you see why value is subjective if we go back to these under this so they're broad approaches value is subjective in the sense you might look at some particular asset you might look at some price you might see when when you have these discussions right some people say that let's say you look at Tesla stock okay um, Some people might say that Tesla is undervalued at this price. Okay, if you listen to the discussion, there's a very wide divergence of views on Tesla. You will see one type of one camp, camp is actually saying that Tesla is undervalued. Okay, this company has huge potential. So the fair value of Tesla is maybe something like $600 or something like that. Okay, so that you've heard these kind of comments, undervalued, overvalued. Yes. You've heard these comments. This is what they this is what they're talking about. Okay, so when they're saying undervalued and overvalued, they're essentially disagreeing with the market price. They're essentially saying the market price is not correct. Either it's overvalued or undervalued. Again, that terminology is not correct actually. But this is what they mean. You've heard this expression undervalued, overvalued. So this is basically where is this value coming from? Let's take the example of Tesla, where there's actually a very wide divergence of views. I've never seen a stock where there's such a wide uh, Some people think this thing is worth zero. This is a fraud. And some people think this is worth like I've seen one uh, lady coming on and talking about I think she said something like two thousand five hundred dollars or something like that the fair price which is now trading at 242 <laughs> she said it's just two thousand five hundred dollars okay so where is all this stuff coming from okay now first of all understand that these people are talking about when we talk about value what we are talking about is you need to understand that this is fair value okay this is an important concept in finance when we're talking about value we are talking about actually fair value okay so when this lady comes out and says that tesla is worth two thousand five hundred dollars that is her assessment of the fair value of tesla stock okay now where did the sh so, so understand this okay so the price is always clear no doubt about the price 242.7 but she thinks the fair value is $2,500 okay so now that's a, that's basically the value or the fair value so to understand that now where is this coming from okay you run remember now so now we look at so now we have some idea about the broad difference at the high level which is technicals versus not just fundamentals there are other approaches okay but the basic difference is in technicals understand we understand that we don't care about value because we only look at price we don't care about anything else okay we don't care whether undervalued overvalued all that all i care about is which way is the wave going next okay like here for instance i would form a view that actually although long term i'm not sure where it's going but this one wave is over i think so i think actually that tesla will actually rally now moving up to about 320 or something like that that's my view how do i form that view i just look at the price 
based on the price pattern i take a call on where the wave is going next i'm not interested in where their battery plant is located how many cars they're selling in china whether they got a leg they got a tax concession in china i'm not interested in all these things okay i just look at the chart and i think this is where the chart is going okay that's 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 basically what you mean by ta which is value agnostic understand that this is value agnostic because i'm not really interested in what the fair value is all i care about is the price movement is this clear this philosophy is clear yeah sir i thought you said you do not care about the new for about the new shareholders yeah but like whenever here bank shares about the indian stock in our previous project we always looked at new related stock for example we were buying at pfc stock we saw that they have declared a quarterly profit yeah we said we expect that will do uh, work that is our view yeah so for i forming the view we do look at this is that wrong no no it's not wrong it's just a different approach that's all so what i'm trying to and i what i'm trying to show you here in this broad split you should be aware of this okay because this is again remember what i said about mean reversion and momentum you need to understand what kind of trader you are for yourself by looking at charts forming views you will find that you usually fall into one camp or the other okay so typically you should understand yourself that's very important understanding yourself is very important what is your style as an investor okay so that's very important that's one of the important learnings that you should have been going through these uh, elective courses okay that you should when you come out at the end of 2 years you should be fairly clear about what kind of you are a momentum trader fine you don't believe in fundamental analysis you are a purely technical trader also fine you don't have to be that way you can be the other way also but you should be clear about what you are okay so yeah so it's not wrong the answer to your question is it's not wrong and i deliberately told you to do that because i don't want to box you into one style i want you to also develop the feel for from a fundamental perspective because when i'm training you i can't train you to be in one corner only okay so you should be able i have to train you in a comprehensive way so that you are approach you are then eventually it's your duty to figure out how eventually when you get into the industry how you want to function that's your duty but i have to train you in a comprehensive way so that's why i also told you try to follow the news flow and try to understand how the try to see a connection between the stock price movement and the news flow and make your own sense of it right i told you to make your own sense of it that that's uh, this own feel is very important yeah yeah in value we creating our own perspective about looking at the other factors so that will only impact the price So how is it different? No, no, no. I'll just explain. Let me explain a little bit more about value. Okay. So we took this. Are you satisfied, Chug? Okay. Your answer is coming a little bit more. Okay. Just wait for a while. Okay. So I have told you to do it that way because I wanted you to have the comprehensive approach. So that's not wrong. That just means that you are you are practicing. Uh, even if you are practicing TA, you are also practicing FA. That is, you are doing looking at the fundamentals also. What Chug was doing. What he's talking about. Looking at the news. That just means that it's not wrong. Okay. So. but understand this difference now let's take this example to understand this difference so what this lady is saying she had fair value is $2500 price is over here what where is she getting that from you remember you've done your all your dividend discount model and all this stuff that you have done all the stock fair value earnings either you discount earnings with cost of equity or you discount operating cash flow which you will probably again do in your cfm okay so now where are those cash flows coming from you are basically projecting in various years okay you are taking like this year 1 year 1 year 2 year 3 whatever year 4 5 so on and so forth let's just take only 3 years so you are projecting some cash flow at the end of the first year some cash flow at the end of the second year some cash flow at the end of the third year This is how you derive all your valuations. Even your dividend discount model, you are projecting some dividends in future years. It's all the same structure, right? Whether you're putting in cash flows or you're putting in or you're putting in operating cash flows and discounting by the cost of capital, overall cost back, or you're putting in the cost, the earnings, and you're discounting by cost of equity. Remember that, right? When your numerator is earnings, you have to discount by cost of equity. when your numerator is operating cash flow you have to discount by all blank that means this all actually you have to define discount by wac because the operating cash flow the interest has not been paid right you have to add back the interest and all that right so that that 
amount it belongs to both uh, both suppliers of capital debt suppliers and equity suppliers that return that you are discounting the operating cash flow that you are discounting the reason you have to use wac and not cost of equity is because that return stream belongs to both are you following yes sir that belongs to both suppliers of capital debt suppliers and equity suppliers but when you are discounting earnings you don't discount by wac because earnings is already at the last one last row earnings is already the last row you understand earnings is net income net profit profit after tax whatever you want to call it net profit profit after tax okay net income the us they call it net income are you following you heard these terms everybody looking like i'm talking in japanese or something <laughs> profit after tax have you heard this expression yes. okay so so this basic this is actually also something that i test for but i just glossed over it because we are covering something a uh, little bigger but this point also should be clear when you are doing the cfm course that when you are what are you discounting first you have to be clear about what are you discounting what cash flow, what uh, uh, I, I i like to use the general term returns if you use a general term like returns it covers everything operating cash flow dividends earnings uh, whatever else okay uh, everything is covered in returns returns is a general term so i like to use the word returns so that we don't use uh, so always use general terms unless there's a reason for using the only the specific term so depending on what kind of return stream you are discounting you have to see who does this stream belong to i mean who has to be paid with this stream so when you are looking at the operating cash flow you have to use that to pay both bondholders and stockholders so that's why you divide by the weighted average cost of capital okay this is clear and then when you are discounting so remember this part okay so this is just i didn't have a interactive discussion on on this because obviously that takes more time but i am just uh, you know shoving it into your brain that when you are discounting the operating cash you have to use wac and you are discounting earnings you have to use cost of equity because the earnings belongs to only cost of e uh, equity providers right earnings is the same as net income profit after tax okay so uh, this is what you do right so what is this lady doing this lady who feels that this 2500 dollars is the fair value where is that thing coming from okay this is basically like you go back to the example i gave you about the, your senior sena who make who came up with this value of 74 dollar 74 rupees okay what is he doing essentially he is using either he is discounting operating cash flow projections which is typically i think what you will do with cfm because you will have to make lots of assumptions about capex and uh, working capital requirements this that so you will probably be focusing mainly on operating cash flow okay and then you will have to discount that and then you will get the the firm value and then you will subtract the market value of the debt and you will get you basically you do go through a enterprise value calculation so uh, what is she doing she is here she is here essentially okay this lady is here so this stock you can use either dividend uh, you can basically do either dividend discount model or earnings discount okay or operating cash flow then subtract the enterprise value method okay but this is basically what she is doing okay so this she is coming out with a value of this which means what so basically the main thing that is driving her fair value estimate and these are i remember these are all fair value models okay have i used the word fair value somewhere i put it in your notes okay so when we say value we will just use value because it's shorter but what we mean is fair value fair value why what is why is it fair because when she is using this model obviously she has to do some exercise like this she has to put the years and then she has to put the earnings figures let's say she's just discounting earnings to keep it simple then so she has to put some earnings figures okay now based on her estimate of the earnings figure which can differ from rajan's estimate which can differ from kanika's estimate all can be different there's no reason to expect that they all three come up with the same estimate so this is where this is why we say this is value is subjective so what she is doing is based on her estimate of the earnings because she basically feels that the adoption rate of electric vehicles is going to be very very high that's her main driver of her value estimate and therefore she feels that they are going to sell a lot more cars and therefore they'll have lot more earnings okay and that's how she so how is she coming up basically she's putting the numbers into this model right same model that you got already familiar with the dividend discount model or earnings discount model right same model she's putting in there and then she's getting this fair value of 2005 obviously if you put in a big enough number in the numerator you can always get a discounted value which is big 
all I have if I want a big discounted value which is the uh, you know uh, NPV kind of a figure right okay or uh, just the the fair value of the asset the discounted uh, net present value of the figure of the future earning streams all I need to do is put in a sufficiently big number in the numerator and I'll get my return are you sure are you are you following yes. right i'll get a thing so that is what is happening here so that's why we say and this is subjective obviously this value is subjective because actually there is no reason to believe that either she is right or rajan is right or kanika is right because they could all be wrong because they we don't know what's going to happen in the future okay so the basic uncertainty that just like in life nobody pretends that nobody says that you know i'm going to live till 95 you know, I'm very sure I'm going to live till 95. Nobody makes stupid statements like this because we all know that life is uncertain. So that what you have to really understand, which you will never find in any textbook or any of these courses and all which are peddled, is that the basic uncertainty of life applies to markets and economies also. Eventually, you don't know. Like you can see for yourself markets, how unpredictable markets are. Okay. So this base, you see, you need to have this in your head that this is basically just subjective. Okay, this is subjective because it depends on the individual's uh, preferences, you can call it preferences. Okay, so this lady is very bullish, she thinks that the adoption rate is going to be very high. Okay, and there are some other people like Jim Chanos, who is a very well known short seller. Jim Chanos thinks this company is a fraud. He thinks this company is going to zero. So he's actually selling Tesla short. Okay, so therefore this because he feels that this is not going to be such a high, there's not going to be such a high adoption rate and he feels there are lots of operating problems in this company okay and one of the things he looks at is the high executive turnover that he uses as one of the indications of a company in trouble that lots of executives are leaving head of production leaves head of legal leaves head of marketing leaves regular turnover lots of churn he sees that as indication of a company in trouble okay so anyway the point is that this is subject who knows who's right okay nobody knows who's right so this is what the first thing you have to understand is the difference between price and value is value is subjective now you understand what value is subjective you understand why value is subjective so all these things and even the stuff that you're going to be doing you're basically be doing this in your corporate finance modeling you're going to be in this box essentially okay so this box is what I would call it's a species of FA what you guys are doing all this falls under FA okay this stuff that you do this is most of the equity analysis that goes on in the industry when you hear of equity analysts okay specializing in particular sectors this is basically what they're doing they're talking about if you have a tech, tech specialist they'll be talking about you, you if you're listening to Bloomberg technology it's a very important program I think everybody should listen to it every day you really need to know what's going on you'll see all these uh, there are there are equity analysts focusing on technology so they'll come and talk about okay if they're talking about Apple they'll say okay Apple services revenue is going to keep growing these are all basically these are all subjective assessment how do you know what's going to happen but they will make some assumption assumptions about how fast Apple's services revenue is going to grow and from that they are going to make projections about Apple's earnings okay and then from there they'll come out with a fair value for Apple like some people are saying Apple is still undervalued okay so they'll come up with a fair value but essentially this is what you're doing all your this is all what we call FA fundamental analysis you have to look at the industry you have to look at global growth you have to look at US China trade wars you have to look at what is happening any other competitors like one of the things they're saying is now because Apple watch they have discounted the entry level price $199 now they're saying that's bad news for Fitbit because that's going to affect the Fitbit sales okay so these kinds of considerations the point to understand is these kind this kind of thinking okay this is all what we call FA looking at how one product pricing this market share global growth sectoral growth okay technological innovations all this stuff battery adoption uh, Tesla's battery factory efficiency okay what will be the rate of adoption of, uh, of um, electric vehicles these are all in the realm of FA okay so basically this is what we call what I, this is what I mean by when I say if you go back to the earlier statement about TA this is what I meant that in TA you are value agnostic so when I took a view on Tesla 
I don't, when I'm saying that this is going to go back to this level, basically roughly around here, okay, so we're just slightly above 300. I'm not talking about all this analysis and all. I'm just looking at the chart and making a projection, okay, which is also a completely legitimate approach. Although many people in the industry try to pretend that this is not, but actually I'm telling you it's a legitimate approach, okay. So, so there you understand what is meant by value agnostic now. Now that you understood what is price, price is objective, value is subjective. And I've given you a flavor of what I mean by value is subjective. Now, does everybody understand why I say value is subjective? Yes, sir. Because how is value derived? All these models that you guys are going to be using again in CFM, these are all subjective. Be very clear about that. Okay, these are all subjective. Because you're making some assumptions about the future growth of sales and this costs and for future growth of capex. Okay, working capital required. These are all assumptions. These are just a bunch of, I like to call models like a bunch of assumptions. Okay, nothing wrong with that, but you have to understand that these are a bunch of assumptions. Are you following what I'm saying? Very important to understand because sometimes people don't get it into their head. You know, they just put out, they just churn out the numbers and they say, look, I've done, look, daddy, I've got this answer. You know, it's like the kid has done some major job in, you know, for the first time. So, uh, it's, you have to have understanding that these are just a bunch of assumptions. Okay. So, what Sina should have done, what I told him to do at that point is, you came out with a fair value of 74 for the stock. But the market price is some like 414 or something like that. So, now you to complete your analysis, you need to then make some comments about the market price. Why is the market price so high? Obviously, they are estimates of the uh, market's estimate. If the market price is correct, okay, if the market price is correct or if the market is using the same valuation models, if you assume, okay, then obviously the market's projections for earnings and uh, revenues is much more optimistic than yours. So, you need to make this connection, okay. So, and obviously, nobody knows who's right. It may be that you're right and the market is wrong and maybe the price will come crashing down okay you don't know actually but the point is you need to understand why the market price is different so you need to point i'm trying to make is that you need to make a connection between your fair value estimate and the market price it doesn't stop at the level where you just came out with your bunch of assumptions like most of the students were doing it this way that we did some i made a forecast so who cares about your forecast? <laughs> you made a forecast. What is the value of your forecast? Okay, like is that at the end of the, I mean, they made a forecast and their job is over. Okay, I made a forecast. Okay, so you have to understand that this, these are all subjective and then you have to connect it to the market price. Is this clear? Okay, so I spent, maybe I spent too much time on this, but let's try and understand this framework. All this stuff you have done, now you understand what is meant by value agnostic. In TA, we don't care about all this value. We don't do all this market analysis. I just look at the price and I make a projection, just like a surfer. Okay, surfer is just riding the waves. He doesn't understand anything about the physics. Okay, of the how, why these waves are forming and all that. Okay, so the other thing that you understand is value versus in this other box where you're doing FA. Think about one more thing which you're doing. Okay, let's look at value investing. Let's look at value investing. What are you doing now? You understand. So let's stick with the stick. Let's stick with the. Let's stick with this example of the lady who thinks that Tesla's fair value is two thousand five hundred. Okay, two thousand five hundred dollars. What is she doing? She's got a bunch of projections. She's made a bunch of projections. Okay, and she assesses that because it is actually true that if you knew, if you knew for sure that the tesla is going to that tesla is going to produce these earnings figures in the next 10 years and next 20 years if you had perfect foresight and you could see for sure that these are going to be the returns then it is clear that this the discounted value of those returns would be the correct value of the stock is that clear if you could be sure but obviously you're not sure okay so instead of you are just putting in a bunch of assumptions about what it would be and based on this you're saying this so according to you this is what why do i say i'm now trying to explain why am i saying value versus price comparison based analysis how does the system work okay how does this whole system work okay the way it works is so this lady does this analysis for tesla projecting the earnings and she comes up with a fair value of two thousand five hundred dollars okay so what she will do now is she will keep look at her fair value she thinks she's pretty sure that is these are the correct earnings numbers and based on that the fair value should be 2500 so she then looks at the market price which is much much below far below the fair value okay her estimate of fair value okay and then let's understand this one more statement that people make okay 
so she will say that this is undervalued are you following no, let me put this down here undervalued you heard this expression yes. okay in this situ situation like this she will use this expression she will say that tesla is undervalued okay this is what the market lingo is this is what people do in the market this is how they talk actually this terminology is not correct what she should be saying is what she means what she means is that is under priced relative to my estimate of fair value fb is fine if i write fp for fair value is that fine so understand this so you have to understand you need to know what the market lingo is at the same time you also need to be aware of when the market is using logically incorrect language like option pricing model is actually incorrect it should be option valuation model but everybody uses option pricing model you have no choice okay but you should be aware that it's wrong okay so when you say undervalued what you actually mean is that because the market does not value anything the market prices it okay so you have to be careful about the use of price versus value so when she says that tesla is undervalued at 243 dollars because my estimate of fair value is 240 uh, is 2500 dollars what she actually means is that tesla is underpriced relative to my estimate of fair value are you following you should be able to understand what the logically correct statement should be when people say it's undervalued because the market does not value things the market prices things okay so value is something that exists in your head okay see will have, uh, one person will have one value the other person will have a different value these are all subjective estimates value is always subjective okay other than certain cases of arbitrage free valuation which will come to in which case it's essentially objective if you can execute the arbitrage okay so basically what she should what she means here is the market is underpriced relative to my estimate of fair value is this point clear now why i'm saying this so this terminology is not correct and obviously you have to flip it around for overvalued when you say that something is overvalued what you actually mean is it is overpriced relative to my estimate of fair value that's very important don't say relative to fair, fair value is nothing objective okay like what time will the sun rise tomorrow that's objective we know okay but fair value is my estimate of fair value that puts in the emphasis on the fact that fair value is always subjective it's my estimate of fair value okay all right so all this stuff that you have done okay in the case of government bonds and obviously there's a little there's no uncertainty about the payment especially local currency government bonds although the the russian default is one exception to this but generally you have to understand when you're doing this kind of uh, uh, the fa what we call fa all your stock dividend uh, golden growth model all falls under fa okay and now why am i calling it value versus price comparison so now when she this this lady sees this uh, her fair value is 2500 but the market is trading at 240 243 what do you sh think she is going to do buy or sell buy she will buy okay so this is what you call value investing we had a earlier discussion about value investing and warren buffett and his style of value investing and howard marx is also actually a value value investor okay although we normally think of these are actually people which i should mention here okay uh, these are i don't know if i've already mentioned this uh, i think i've mentioned have i mentioned this before buffett uh, read i mentioned howard marx memos yes sir. yeah so let me just mention some other people uh, that you should listen to a uh, very important figure these are uh, on the topic of people you should listen to um Jim Chenos is a short seller. You get a lot of interesting analysis. Okay, so this is actually off topic. These are just some names that you should listen to, uh, that you should actually follow. I'm just putting it in italics. Okay, maybe we should just move this to another part of the discussion. Yeah. Okay. 
all right so under price this is we have understood now what is she going to do she's going to buy okay so this is essentially what value investing is about it's about first step you have to calculate the fair value of some asset and you should really think of value investing as uh, being applicable to although typically the market talks about it only in the context of equities okay and it gives the warren buffett is one example of that there are many other well-known value investors but actually there you should think of it as a more general uh, approach which can be applied to any asset and howard marks is an example oak tree investments uh, which uh, basically uh, applies value investing to bonds they mainly invest in bonds but the same thing the same analysis the steps are basically this that first you do your analysis of the fair value based on your projections like this you project into the future you predict the returns from the asset in the future what you think will be the returns you discount it using the appropriate discount rate okay now here you have to understand this typically when you have problems with your fair value that is you come up with a fair value of 2500 but you find the market never moves really from 240 dollars it kind of pretty much stays there or goes lower when you have problems with your fair value there are two elements to this one is the numerator and the denominator when you have the discount rate right in the denominator you have the discount rate usually the problem is with the numerator most of the time the problems arise because the return projections don't work out because in the denominator there's not much it's not really very the value is not really very sensitive to the denominator compared to the variation you can have in the numerator so most of the reason most of the time the reason these fair value estimates go wrong is because you did not get the return projections right are you following this is where the errors in most of the models are i mean in, in, when you realize later on that you have problems okay so this lady thinks that okay it's going to 2005 and let me buy it but eventually she finds that this keeps on dropping and goes lower and lower which eventually what this typically means is that 2500 there were two major drivers of that value one was the discount rate and one was the return projections so what another thing that i'm telling you is that essentially the main uh, problem is it lies with the return projections usually the discount rate is not much of a problem in terms of errors but the return projections are very prone to error okay so this is basically yeah any question okay so now what do i mean so that's why i'm saying that i'm making this fundamental distinction between these two approaches to solving the buy sell problem one is you notice ta doesn't care about value at all value agnostic and in the second approach i'm calling it value versus price okay you notice what is common to all these approaches which you have already used project analysis stock analysis bond analysis you have done all these things bond valuation formula you have done npv project irr all this stuff you have done in all of these things what is common is you will make some you will drop some future periods you will make some projections about what returns will come out in those future periods and you will discount those returns it is common method of analysis okay for everything that is the basic formula for the fair value of any asset project the returns discount the returns okay and typically you when you make mistakes it means you you got the return projections wrong okay usually that's what happens so this is the basic thing and what are you doing here you're comparing and what is this lady doing you see in the first step she computes the fair value of 2500 right making her projections right the next step she compares it to the price can you see that so the decision to buy or sell can you see how the decision to buy or sell is driven by a comparison between the fair value and the price right if the price was also 2500 and she thinks the fair value is 2005 then she would not have bought right because it is correctly priced are you following the logic why am i saying that because why are we discussing these approaches we are talking about what are the broad approaches to solving the buy sell problem one is ta value agnostic now we're talking about the other type which is the other approach which is value versus price comparison based analysis so all the stuff you have done before all your stock valuation is actually part of this framework which i'm sure you were not aware of so far right you didn't have a clear idea about that but this is basically what it is okay you are in this box when you're doing all this stock analysis dividend growth mod garden growth model and all this stuff when you're doing this you are actually in this box okay so you have to basically also understand if you feel if your own worldview is that 
I don't really care about all this stuff. I don't think all this fundamental stuff matters. I think the market is just crazy. It just goes up and down. Okay. And therefore, I should trade it purely from a technical approach because all this analysis is a waste of time because the market is not rational. Okay. If you have that view, I'm not saying you have to have that view, but if you have that view, it's important. That's why I said it's very important to understand what you really feel about the market. What are your views? What are your own approaches? If you have that view, then it doesn't make sense for you to do all this stuff because it's not consistent with your worldview. Okay, let's say I don't believe in democracy. I believe in violence and I believe in uh, uh, gaining territory through violence. Then why should I participate in all this voting and all that stuff? This is not a good example, but my point is that it depends on your worldview. So you have to be clear about what your worldview is. And that is what has to be shaped by your projects. The reason I make you do all these uh, live projects is you should develop your own feeling about what the market really is. Is the market really a kind of uh, animal which is susceptible to this kind of analysis, which is better analyzed in this approach? Or is it a kind of animal which is better analyzed in this approach? That you decide for yourself. I'm not forcing you to decide either way. But I'm just saying that this is what you need to do. Okay, you need to go through the exercise for yourself. Okay, so now please understand, okay, what is happening here? Who is talking? Pulkit, you'll lose marks. Don't, there should be no talking in the class. Okay. All right. Now, under value, we are discussing. Now, we are discussing basically this part, which is uh, so everything doesn't have to be written down because you. Okay. So uh, now you understand what is value versus price. Why am I calling these fundamental approaches value versus price, and what is value agnostic? Why am I making this distinction? Now you understand. Yes, sir. So all this analysis that you are doing, this is basically falling under this paradigm. Okay. These are par you heard the word paradigm. Have you or not? New word? Paradigm? You've heard it? Okay, great. So don't have to write, I don't have to write it down. Okay. So paradigm is just a worldview. Like capitalism is a paradigm. Socialism is a paradigm. In socialism, you have no private property. Okay. So in capitalism, you have private property. The different ways of looking at things. That's a paradigm. Okay. So essentially, you are in this paradigm. When you're doing all this, you're in this paradigm. What is the objective of doing this fair value calculation? The process doesn't stop there. Why are you even doing this fair value calculation? Like in most, in many of the, uh, the courses and textbook, you'll find there's a discussion of valuation. The valuation kind of drops from the sky. Like why valuation? Why are you doing valuation? Valuation is connected to this decision problem of buy or sell. That you have to understand. That the whole question of valuation comes because of this decision problem has to be solved. Because the decision problem has to be solved. And you have decided to solve it by being in this column and not in this column. That is your decision. That is why you need the fair value estimate. Okay, the first step you come out with a fair value estimate. Second step you compare the fair value to the price. Fair value is 2500, price is far below. So being a value investor, now you buy. Because, and why do you buy? If you buy, that means what do you expect about the price? It's going to go up or down? Uh -huh. Up. Okay. So the fair value is 2500 and the market is far below fair value. You are buying. So obviously you expect this to go up, right? So is value investing a mean reversion approach or tech, a momentum approach? Mm -hmm. Momentum. Sir, I'm buying for the expectation to go up. Not grow up, but go up. Okay. No. Uh, in a way you're right because in a way you're right because everywhere everything really is momentum okay everything really is momentum okay so we have to be very careful about the distinction but this distinction applies only at uh, the distinction at any point of time applies only to a fixed time frame a fixed zoom in this zoom you are a mean reversion player if you buy if you are buying now in this zoom obviously you're right in the sense if we narrow the zoom if we zoom in further and we look at this you are expecting this to go up yes if we narrow are you following what i'm saying if you zoom in further and look at only this degree of movement you are expecting this to continue at this little rally that has started go up but the point is that momentum versus mean reversion has to be understood at a fixed zoom only at this zoom level if you are buying actually you are a mean reversion player because you are expecting now the mean is probably a little bit higher than this the average level average price probably is somewhere here 
okay on this chart and you're expecting it to go and revert towards the mean that's why you're buying okay so value investing is everyone clear about this did i explain this to you earlier that value investing is a mean reversion approach okay so um, yeah 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 if you if you have a, a lower value obviously yeah if you have a lower value this will happen okay if you have a lower value then essentially if you but that's not how typically uh, what will happen is if you are estimate of the fair value uh, is lower than this as a value investor you will not you will not sell you will not sell effectively if you feel that the fair value is much lower then actually what happens is typically i agree logically you should sell okay but typically then again when you are selling in that kind of situation they sell into very overvalued uh, uh, you know very strong trends they typically sell into very strong trends they don't sell into this kind of a situation okay typically when you are a value investor you would sell you would think that something like maybe uh, apple is overvalued now people are saying that apple is overvalued some people are saying it so then you would sell apple but apple if you look at the apple chart it's been pretty much going up all the time okay for the last several years if you look at apple okay so it would not work like that value investors when they are selling into a stock if you want to look at apple now we'll just i'll just complete the discussion but that's how it will work essentially okay so value investor will not be uh, selling into this kind of situation even if they feel the fair value is lower okay so in that case they would actually wait to buy it at a lower level let it fall through the fair value or go to fair value okay and uh, or, uh, then then only they would fall through the fair value then only they would buy okay so this is why we say that i'll just wrap up this discussion here so this is why we say value versus price now you understand why i'm saying value versus price so that all this exercise that you do the objective is to compare it to the fair value and then if the price is far below the fair value you would uh, you would buy it if it is far above the fair value you would sell it okay in this case if you see if you will just have a brief look at apple the net is a bit slow but if you see here then obviously if you look at the daily chart and all that uh, which yeah yeah you can see this yes, sir. Tarun, now you see what i'm saying now the guy who is going to sell apple okay first of all value investors typically operate asymmetrically they don't sell when something is basically typically value investors only buy when the price is far below fair value okay they don't sell because in the kind of markets in which they operate that selling typical selling is not really uh, common okay but if you were a, a symmetrical value investor and you were selling uh, a stock which is overvalued your typical estimate would be that the fair value of apple is something like 100 or something like that now it's been going up it's gone up all the way here so now again you see you become a mean reversion player because when it's gone up so much you're trying to sell the mean is a little bit lower here and you're again looking for a movement back to the mean are you following this this is clear now okay so you've learned at least this basic stuff we will continue this discussion i think garvid is getting restless now so 1101 okay all right so we can any any technical questions then i won't close the video right now yeah one question yeah time will expire like maximum time will expire there's no maximum time you have to see where the uh, like here for instance we are looking at crude oil options you can see they are trading if you look at the crude oil options you can see that they are trading all the way here you this depends the general the answer to your question is the general answer is that it depends on the liquidity of the particular option market concern so india don't worry about india india markets are not developed that's why i don't teach you from a india perspective because if you learn from an india perspective you have the things you won't learn yeah yeah you can buy very long dated options depends on what the market is providing depends on the market if the market itself is not liquid if the underlying typically you need good underlying liquidity okay here crude oil futures are very un, very liquid so that's why you see look at crude oil futures see see where you can go with crude oil futures you can go up to 2029 okay 
so they have listed options till 2029 i don't know how much will be available but you can still see something is going on okay uh, maybe we'll see some bid on ask prices it's a little bit far away okay but maybe there's so there's maybe there's no activity here but uh, the point is that the, it is providing for that kind of listing because the underlying is very liquid here and the futures market and so therefore the option market has a chance to be more liquid india the activities of 300 okay about india we are learning theory right now so we want to learn general because whatever you learn about option trading you are going to do a project on us equity options okay everything you learn in the theory of option trading with respect to us equity options exactly the same thing will be applied in india nothing will change except obviously your underlying markets will change your options will change and then you will be constrained by the liquidity of the particular market so if you are operating in the indian market the liquidity is much less as you saw in the case of your trading of cash stocks on the nse half the stuff you can't sell yes. because the short selling facility the short selling uh, liquidity has not developed right so that's why we study with respect to us markets because us markets are most developed so you get to see what a real developed market is doing. yeah okay any other technical question okay you have a non tech non technical question yes sir uh, you said the video which you sent for the project was not working it was private no you have one minute one minute you have to log in with your dsp id okay sir and uh, secondly sir uh, i want to sir change my group basically why do you have to change your group sir because people in my okay, group one minute really do not have a view